Okay, so yes, welcome everybody to the uh, ninth iteration of our CMFI mass spec seminar. It's my great pleasure to have Kai Dürkop today um, to give the lecture on in silico spectrum annotation with Sirius. And to those of you who do not know Kai, he's uh, one of the main developers of, of Sirius, which I find quite an, an awesome tool for in silico annotation of MSMS data. Um, and yeah, it's my great pleasure to have him here. Maybe a couple of words about uh, his background. So Kai did his diploma um, in Jena at the um, university. Um, already his diploma thesis was uh, Sebastian Berger on, yeah, I think uh, in silico uh, mass spectrometry and then also his, his PhD and is also now a postdoctoral researcher um, in the Berger lab. In the meantime, he also spent some time uh, in uh, the Dorstein lab in San Diego where I had the great pleasure to sit uh, next to him actually. And then he also spent some time uh, in Finland in the uh, group of uh, you who uh, rose at the uh, Alto University. So yeah, I think with, without further ado, uh, Kai is gonna walk us through Sirius and uh, show us how to annotate MSMS spectra today. And yeah, with this, uh, Kai, thanks again for, for joining and for giving the lecture and looking forward uh, to the seminar. Yeah, thanks for the kind words. Uh, let's see, share our screen. Does it work? Yeah, looks great. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, maybe first uh, the like, uh, colleagues uh, who also work on the series, Markus, Markus, Martin, and Sebastian, our PI. Um, Usually I do this slide in the end, but uh, probably I will forget that when we come into discussions. So today it's about our, our tool series uh, for small molecule identification and annotation. And as far as I understand in your um, seminar, you basically already covered um, most part of the metabolomic workflow, which is usually, the, I mean, of course, the measurement with tandem MSMS and then all this pre-processing, peak picking, feature detection, feature grouping, isotope detection, feature alignment uh, across the measurements. Um, and I think you did this with MC-9-2, and MC-9-3 actually. And so basically the next step is then the feature annotation. So the question, what are these uh, compounds or what are the features that uh, we did measure? And that's then usually um, a step where, yeah, Sirius comes in. Um, I have to say, um, Sirius, the, the current version of Sirius can also do the pre-processing. So the big difference between the Sirius pre-processing and the MC9 pre-processing is that Sirius pre-processing is totally non-interactive, um, which means you just put the data in, get results, and you have to live with that. Um, so if you invest a lot of time measuring your data, you should also invest some time uh, inspecting your data. So uh, I think the, the important thing using MC9 is really that you can check are the parameters I selected really good and is the peak which are picked uh, really the correct ion and so on. So if you invest time to uh, inspect your data, then you should definitely use MC9. Um, but I also noticed sometimes that, uh, you know, people set all your parameters in MC9, store them in XML file and then give them around to colleagues and everyone is just using the XML file and never look in the data again. Um, if you do that, you can also just use the zeros preprocessing. Uh, it's probably better than using a default XML file. But of course, the best thing would be choose your own parameters and uh, yeah, look into the data. Um, so, anyways, I don't want to talk about preprocessing today, but really about feature annotation, in particular about these four questions. Um, so, if we have the MS1 and the associated MS2 spectra of an unknown ion. Um, what is its molecular formula? What are the structural features, like uh, which side groups or you know, structural patterns are contained in this molecule? What is the molecular structure and to which chemical class does it belong? And one thing I want to highlight is that it is question one, two, and four are database free or can be answered database free, um, which I think is important as soon as you leave model organism and really, you know, want to discover new stuff. You cannot expect that all the compounds you have measured are contained in databases. And only basically the database search 
or the structural database search is uh, really something which happens in a database. And on the right side, basically, these are the, the not really the tools, but the modules, basically, which are doing uh, or which are used for answering these questions. So just to make things confusing, our software is named Sirius, and it has a lot of modules with their own names, and one module is also called Sirius. Uh, anyways, so basically, Sirius and Zodiac are the modules for the molecular form annotation. These, I think, are the, is the module for the structure an uh, annotation, and Canopus is for chemical class analysis. Um, yeah, and I will just give a short overview about these modules and how to use them. And I think the um, best thing is if I not just give a talk and then we go on to the data, but uh, I will in the talk stop and you now work a little bit on the on the tool and you can uh, try it on your own um, if you have insight it and then we continue with the talk. I think it's better. Um, yeah, so usually you, you can download Sirius on this address. However, um, in this workshop, we will use the current pre-release version because uh, there's a, a new version of Sirius which should be out since, I don't know, a month or something, and it somehow doesn't come out, uh, but it will be hopefully released soon. And so we will use this pre-release version, which you can get here. And I think also post the link in the chat. Um, otherwise, you get here basically the, the complete documentation and so on. Um, and yeah, um, if you install it on Windows, you will get a warning by Windows that it's you know an unknown program. And if you really want to install it, and it could be a virus or something. It's it's not a virus. You can just install it. Um, if anybody has problems with installing the software and running it, just uh, just tell me now. Um, otherwise, basically, you can. Well, it. After installing, it should just appear in the Windows uh, Start menu and should be. Wasn't it Open. Like this. And yeah, the first thing is basically um, creating the user user account. So it should come up a pop-up web service connection um, with a login button, and you can create your own account with your university email address. Um, or you can just use for this workshop this guest account um, with this email address and this password, which I already posted in the chat. Uh, they can just copy paste it. And yeah, hopefully then this is how it looks like. Should be all green buttons, meaning everything is online. I hope this is the case because we had an update in the morning and since then everything is a little bit unstable. But yeah, I hope everything will be uh, working today um, because Zeros is doing some of its computation online. So you always need an internet connection. Um, yeah, so just. So basically, um, to this is your your workspace, and or we call it project space, and it's basically the same like an empty mine. You can just uh, put all your data into this project space and store it in a directory. And um, as I said, you can just track drop MCML files here. Just take them, move them into the uh, left uh, corner, and it will be get imported. I will just show this very shortly for demonstration that it works with MCML, but uh, we will then use the Zero's MGF file from the already pre-processed data. It's now basically picking all the features and now we have basically here on the left side, the list of compounds. And basically uh, the Um, NS1 view, and as you can see, it's it's all very basic. So you can do, uh, you ca can't do as much visualization stuff like an MC mine. So it's really just if you need uh, uh, your data in zeros without doing the MC mine stuff, you can do that. But uh, usually it's better to just use MC mine for that. And 
just take the zeros MGF file, which you can have exported from MCMine or from the feature-based molecular networking and drag and drop it. Okay, maybe one important comment uh, to the um, uh, participants. So if you wanna um, do the same steps as, as Kai right now, uh, one important information is that these files are like the very same files that we used um, four weeks ago when we uh, first processed like the LCMSMS data with MZMINE3. So these are the .mzml files Kai just threw in. And then the other file, the .mgf, is the file Robin exported at the end um, of the seminar. And in case you don't have them handy, we prepared actually a Google folder, which I'm gonna share in the chat with you. And I also shared it um, in the email yesterday. So yeah, feel free to like download these files from there. And then if you have Sirius installed, you should be able to follow like the same processing steps um, as Kai is doing them right now here. Yep, thanks. So basically, you have now on the left all the compounds. So all features basically from MC9. And the naming convention is basically the file name, underscore, and then the feature ID. So if you have a feature in MC9, you can directly find the same feature also here. There's also a search bar, so you can, if you, for example, uh, uh, we have this molecular network here with uh, this Yasini uh, the feature ID uh, 908. If you want to search the spectrum, you can just input this, and then you, you get the, the feature of the MS1 and the MS2. Um, okay. So, as I said, the first, uh, so the, the first question was what's the molecular formula? And um, I always show this slide here because I often hear from people with orbit trap and FTICR and high mass accuracy, this is, this problem is solved. And so basically this is uh, just the ion sphere 48.9 Dalton. And the correct molecular formula is this one here. And this is a two millidalton window and every gray bar is basically one alternative molecular formula explanation. And if you look at a few of them here, you will see they only differ on the fourth uh, decimal, uh, decimal number after the decimal point. So they are super similar to the correct one. And um, your instrument will always have some measurement error, at least also the fourth uh, position after the decimal point. So just from the exact mass, you cannot infer the correct molecular formula. It's not always possible. And um, yeah, that's why you have to add additional information besides uh, exact mass. And Sirius is basically using three sources for that. So the first one is the isotope pattern. So um, we're using it basically for two reasons. First, you can infer from the isotope pattern already which elements are contained in your molecular formula. Like if you have chlorine or bromine or something in there, then you see it directly in the isotope pattern. And so the first thing Zeros is doing usually is inferring the elements. Then it generates all possible molecular formulas that can be created with uh, these elements given the mass. And then it simulates an isotope pattern for each of them and compares it with the measured one. Like here, we have on the downside the measured isotope, uh, the simulated isotope pattern for this molecular formula here. And on the, so this is basically a simulated one for this molecular formula. And on top, this is the measured one. And now um, here you see basically mass differences between the, the peaks on top the measured one, on the bottom the, the real one. And here you see the intensity and this red uh, marker shows you which intensity this molecular formula should have. And you see it's quite close. Like here's a little bit too low intensity, but everything else uh, matches very well. And yeah, basically this can also give, already gives you much information about uh, the molecular formula. Given you have a nice isotope pattern, uh, we will see that in our data, Unfortunately, most time we don't see isotope pattern at all. Um, but yeah, if you have them, they can give a lot of information. But most information actually comes from the MSMS data. 
and there we use fragmentation decommutation tool in field and molecular formula from the MSMS. And the fragmentation tree is basically um, yeah, such a tree like structure where each node in the tree corresponds to a peak in a spectrum. Like this peak, uh, this node here corresponds to this orange peak and it's labeled with the uh, hypothetical molecular formula of this peak. And these arrows in the tree basically are mass difference in the spectrum. And yeah, you can think of it like this is a hypothetical way how a molecule fragments um, in the collision cell basically. However, um, do I have an example of this? Ah, here. Um, however, of course, if you look at this, I mean, that's how these fragmentation fees look like in practice very often. Obviously, uh, in a collision cell, you won't have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven collisions. Um, so it's not that we, this, this is not a real simulation of a, of a fragmentation process, but it's really just an annotation of a spectrum where we annotate all of the peaks and also the mass differences with meaningful molecular formulas. And similar to the molecular formulas, we basically go over all possible trees that can explain your data and then search for uh, the best explanation. And yeah, the third source of information is the network analysis. Um, so I think you are familiar with that from the last seminar. So um, the idea is that if two spectra are very similar, then probably also their structures are very similar. And um, you can think of if you have a molecular formula annotation of each node in a the network, then we can assume that they should be all similar. And if they are not similar, if there's one node, which for example, is a carbohydrate and all other nodes are amino acid molecular formulas, then probably carbohydrate molecular formulas from, and that's uh, the Zodiac uh, module basically. Uh, here's just an example, two structures, super similar spectra, the peaks have the same molecular formula notation. And obviously then also the fragmentation trees corresponding to the spectra are super similar. So they have the same paths on mass differences, so they have the same um, nodes. While if you would have from annotations, then just, I mean, by chance, it's very unlikely that they would be similar. So they might have some nodes which are similar, but they also have a lot of nodes which are dissimilar. So if you compare two unrelated fragmentation trees, then you should get a very low similarity. So what basically Zodiac is doing, it builds up a molecular network, compares all pairs of spectra in there, and if the spectra are similar, then also the trees should be similar. And if this is not the case, then it tries to correct it. So it re-ranks the molecular formula annotations. So to wrap up, we have these three source information. We use isotope pattern analysis, we use fragmentation pattern analysis, and uh, we use the network analysis with Zodiac. And last, the last analysis is basically something you have always have to uh, enable um, yourself, it's not, it's very optional because it only makes sense if your data comes from a biological sample where we really have these kind of related compounds. So if you, for example, order a set of standards, which are just a mixture of standards uh, and measure them, you cannot assume that they are related compounds and then it doesn't make sense to build up a molecular network or do network analysis. Um, yeah, so basically, what does that look in practice? So if you have your compounds, you can analyze them uh, just by right click and click on compute. And here you basically have all these um, tools. The first one is the series tool for molecular formula annotation. And you have a lot of parameters which you can just ignore. So you never really have to change anything on the parameters. You can check the instrument maybe here um, but it's actually not so important. So even if your data is measured in orbit trap and we use QTOFAS instrument, it's not a big thing. It will still work. The difference is just that if you use orbit trap, then you see here, it uses a smaller, uh, um, a better mass accuracy, but otherwise it's barely the same. And click on compute. And then basically we have here the list of molecular formulas which are assigned to the spectrum um, with their corresponding score um, here. And 
what's quite important always is number of explained peaks and number of explained intensity. Um, so in this case, for example, the top molecular formula has also most explained peaks and it also explains 94% of the spectrum. You can see this here. So uh, there are a few peaks which are not explained, but that's, that's normal. I mean, there's also noise in your spectrum. Some peaks just might have a larger mass deviation, which doesn't fall into the 10 ppm range. These things can happen. Beside that, uh, this really nice annotation, I think. Um, you see here also the, the mass errors. And yeah, I think that the important thing you always should look at is the expanded intensity. If less than 80% of your spectrum is explained, then this is always fishy. Then you should, shouldn't trust too much the annotation. And yeah, here you can also look at the tree in detail or at the spectrum in detail and our sets. Here's the MS1 uh, mirror plot. And for some reason, we never really have uh, isotope patterns in the data. Um, you can also compute several components, just watch shift and select them, or click here on compute all on top. This will compute a complete data set. And now you see that there's additional tool here, Zodiac, because if you on, only annotate a single compound, you cannot use network analysis. So this button will only appear if you compute all the data. And um, yeah, uh, again, you can always ignore the parameters here. Um, we won't compute all the data now because uh, series takes quite a long time to compute uh, compounds. Like for data set with 1,000 compounds, you, you cannot uh, compute within a few minutes. It might take hours. Um, but this is basically um, how you would do that. Click on series, click on Zodiac, click on compute, and then it runs all the compounds. Um, here you see the elements which are um, used for the molecular formula analysis. And uh, one common pitfall is that people just add additional elements here, like yeah, maybe there's also iodine in there, and then they add iodine here, and maybe there's also fluorine in there, so they add fluorine. And silicium, silicon, um, yeah, the problem is if you have, let's say, a compound with 500 Dalton, then you already have maybe 1,000 different molecular formulas with this mask, just with CHNOPS. If you add one additional element, you get maybe already several thousand molecular formulas. And if you add an additional element, you might already get 100,000 molecular formulas. And at some point, just explodes. So if you just add more and more elements here, then just uh, the computation will never finish. Uh, there's a question that there's Zodiac not included. I said, uh, I think you have to click on compute all, otherwise it won't be displayed. Um, okay. If you click on a single compound, you also see um, this button auto detect. If you compute all, then auto detect is always enabled by default. And I said, this is basically, it looks into the isotope pattern and then enables elements based on the isotope pattern. But this only works for elements um, which have a characteristic isotope pattern like chlorine, chromine, selenium, um, borine, sulfur. But stuff like fluorine or iodine have to be enabled manually. And my suggestion is if you uh, now that your data contains a lot of strange and rare elements, um, you can always fall back to the molecular formula database search. This is basically this field here above. You click here on all, then instead of computing all possible molecular formulas, it will just go into these databases like HMDB, PubChem, and so on, and download all molecular formulas with this mass here for this compound, and then only look at these molecular formulas. And this will also contain all strange elements which are in PubChem, like if in PubChem there is a compound with this mass which contains uh, ferrum, then it will uh, yeah, also use these compounds, these molecular formulas. And this is computationally feasible, um, using basically all possible molecular formulas and adding more and more elements won't work. It just takes too much time. 
And yeah, the same is basically for high masses. So um, you can just here order components by mass. And usually you always have in most data sets components with very high masses, like here one about 1,000 Dalton. And again, it's basically um, the computational time explodes with the mass. So everything, let's say below 500 Dalton is usually computed within a second. And then it gets slower and slower. Like for 600 Dalton, you might need a minute to compute. And for 900 Dalton, it also already talk, uh, takes an hour or something. And I'm pretty sure that the laptop or desktop PC uh, won't be able to compute uh, if anything about 1,000 Dalton. So you would need to, to compute such high masses, you would need a compute cluster. Um, so it's always a good idea to uh, only compute masses below, let's say, 800 Dalton on your laptop computer. The, in fact, Sirius is doing this usually automatically. So if I click on compute, it asks you, if you really want to compute a high masses too, and you can then say no restrict to 850 Dalton. What you can also do if you have such high uh, mass compounds is again, enabling database search. This is a bit tricky because um, unfortunately, uh, databases are basically incomplete for high masses. So um, if you have mass of 1000 Dalton, then often in a database, there are only three or four molecular formulas with this mass or for the exist probably 100,000 different molecular formulas with this mass in theory. And, um, but still, you know, compute this, it usually takes not so much time because it only has to look at these few molecular formulas which in our database, we see it's a few seconds. So you can compute high mass compounds, but only if you enable, if you use the database search. If you consider all possible molecular formulas, it would have take probably 20 minutes or something. Um, okay, so that's about the molecular formula notation. So basically the next question is then what structural features are present and what is the molecular structure of the um, ion? And we solve this basically with machine learning. So the input is an MS1 and the MSMS and the output, the considered output should be the measured molecular structure. And the problem is that machine learning, um, machine learning is super difficult to predict something like a structure, like a graph. Instead, you always need some kind of easier structure. And in our case, what we really do predict are molecular fingerprints. And molecular fingerprints are basically a vector where each position um, describes a certain substructure. And we write a zero in there if the substructure is um, contained in our molecule or a one, uh, it's not contained in the molecule and a one if it's contained. Like in this case, for example, you would go over all the substructures and then check, is it benzoyl ring in this compound? No, so you find a zero in there. Is the CH3 in this compound? Yes, so you find a one in there and so on. And our molecular fingerprints we use are, I think around 5,000 in size. So we have a list of 5,000 different substructures so um, you can encode molecules quite uh, comprehensively with these fingerprints. But what you cannot do is basically, after having such a fingerprint, you cannot go back to the molecule. So like in this case, uh, if you have this fingerprint, you know, okay, this thing is in there, you know, this thing is in there, but you don't know how to combine these things, you know? So you cannot go back to what's the correct structure. But the nice thing on these fingerprints is that uh, they are really uh, nicely accessible for machine learning. So what we're basically doing is we go now over each of these substructures and then ask, given the spectrum, for example, here, is there an aromatic ring in the mo molecule? And the machine learner is then basically going over all spectra he knows um, for compounds which have a benzoyl ring and search for a common pattern for peaks which somehow indicate, yes, this is this molecule contains a benzoyl ring. And it also uses fragmentation trees for this task. And I just want to uh, show this example here of these flavonoid-like structures, um, where if you lay the spectrum on top of each other, you get basically a zero similarity. So there's not a single peak here, which uh, is contained in these both spectra together. 
And so the cosine is really zero. And if you look at the fragmentation trees, you see that there's a whole subtree basically, which is identical in both uh, structures. And uh, that's just an example of something which is, for example, not possible with the normal cosine search or library search or analytic search. And um, so these I think are these usually taken in MS, MS spectrum, computes the fragmentation tree and then predicts the molecular fingerprint. So for each of these substructures in this list, these 5,000 substructures, it predicts a probability that this substructure is part of your molecule. And after doing so, it can then search in a structure database like PubChem, or more, more likely you want to search in, for example, HMDB or something, or if you have plants in NEPSEC, and then it compares the structures in this library with your predicted fingerprint, and it then ranks them according to how well the predicted fingerprint agrees with the real fingerprint of the structure. And in our case, um, this basically, this is the CSI finger ID uh, sub tool. And this is just the prediction of the fingerprint. And on the right is basically the structure database. Right? So these are two separate steps, which is important because this is database free. So the prediction of fingerprint will always work, even if the compound is not contained in the database, while the structure database search is uh, only working if it's really contained in the database select here. By default, this is bio database, which is basically a, a combination of HNTB, CAC, NEPSEC, uh, Coconut, and so on. So basically almost everything uh, except PubChem. And yeah. Usually this doesn't take so much time, let's see. Um, here's by the way the job list, so you uh, can always check here what is currently running. Okay, and now um, on top of here is the list of molecular formulas ordered by the score which is designed by Sirius. And in green highlighted it's always the molecular formula which is currently is seen as the most likely one. And usually it would be this one because this got the highest score by Sirius, but now we have run CSI finger ID and uh, this is the molecular formula with the best CSI finger ID hit, which is probably because the first four molecular formulas don't have hit at all. Which means maybe this is the correct structure, I don't know, but it could also be that the correct structure is just not contained in the database and this is the correct molecular formula. It's always the problem with um, yeah, if you annotate structures that many structures are just not contained in biological databases. Um, so what you see here is basically the, the list of candidate structures. And the squares here are the substructures in these candidate structure. And they are blue if they are predicted to be in there. And they are red if they are predicted to be not in there. In other words, many blue squares are good many red squares are bad. And in this case, you see there's a lot red squares. So this prediction is not really nice. And if you click on such a red square, it basically shows you, uh, I'm not sure if you can see this so nicely, but it basically highlights here um, the corresponding substructure. Uh, you can also click right click here on highlight matching substructures. And this will basically uh, draw in blue the part of the molecule which is considered to be correct, and it will color in red the part of the molecule which is considered to be wrong. Like if we and here you see the list of predicted fingerprints, and I said uh, five thousand. And the problem is many of these fingerprints are extremely boring. Like uh, this is a fingerprint, uh, this is a position says the molecule contains a heteroatom, which is, you know, quite stupid. You already seen a molecular formula that contains a heteroatom. It's quite boring. And usually what you can do to get more interesting substructures is to sort them by the number of atoms here, and then filter them by substructures which are predicted by a probability of, let's say, 50%. And now you get basically a uh, substructure which are more interesting, like here, uh, some, I think, sugar-like substructure. So it predicts that your compound contains some uh, 
sugar like substructure. What you also see is that many of these substructures are a little bit redundant. So the first top hits are all associated with sugars. And now here comes another substructure, which is predicted to be in there. This seemed to be something associated with amino acids, I think. And here, I mean, if you, you can check some of these uh, fingerprints to get an idea of what, what substructures might be present in your compound. But uh, the problem is, of course, that many of these substructures are not so informative alone. Another thing, um, but I think I will take a smaller molecule for that. Um, or maybe you can just use the, um, the Yazidi Apoptin, that's the feature nine, oh, eight, so zeros, And so if you enter this into the filter list and click on enter, then you get, uh, it's, uh, the compound list is filtered by this search string here. This is basically this uh, feature we have here in our molecular network, the uh, senior bactine. And if we now compute this with serious great fingerprints, search in the molecular structure database. Um, yeah, you get in fact these here senior bactine as top hit. And also, if you click on highlight matching substructure, nicely it uh, says that the wool structure agrees very well with the fingerprint. Here you also see in which database it is contained. You can also click on the links usually. So if you click on a button here, it should open in the, in the browser. I'm not sure I want to try this. Let's see how it works. And yeah, here again, we can look at the, at the fingerprints. For example, here you see that um, this, I think, is a quite typical substructure for this kind of compound class. Um, I think in general, here you see quite nicely the, the different structure elements which are predicted to be in this molecule. What you also can do in this uh, version of series is uh, an in silico fragmenter view. Like here you see the mass spectrum again, the MSM spectrum with the associated molecular formulas from the fermentation tree. And in violet, you have the peaks, which can be assigned to a substructure of the molecule by in silico fragmentation. So if you click on one of these peaks, it suggests how uh, the molecule could, could be fragmented to produce this peak. Like this peak here can be created by breaking this bound. And then these uh, include these fragment basically uh, has exactly the correct mass and molecular formula of this peak. And basically you can do this with all the peaks here. Um, you can also navigate with a keyboard. So if a peak is very small, it's sometimes not so easy to hit. So you can just click on a peak and then with the uh, red and uh, right and left keys of the keyboard, you can navigate to the spectrum. In blue is always the highlighted current peak. And you see, for example, this peak here can be produced by breaking this bound and this bound. And here, the, the fragmenter is still a little bit experimental, um, but it's used basically a scoring based on uh, which kind of bones uh, you break. Like for example, here, a carbon cipher bound is easy to break. A nitrogen carbon bound is very easy to break. While, uh, for example, an aromatic bound is very difficult to break. So you see here that the, the bones have different scores. Here, yeah, so you can really uh, go through this um, view to, to check how well the, the fragmentation of the molecule agrees with the spectrum. And um, the thing is, this in silico fragmentation is not used to rank the compounds. So um, the ranking here is based on our machine learning method with predicting the fingerprints. So this are completely different um, modules, basically. And this is really nice to um, check if the prediction from CSI finger ID makes sense. So if you have here a hit, 
um, you can check if there's also a nice explanation for the fragmentation pattern. Like, use my, is the, uh, can I explain every peak basically by simple bound breaks of the molecule? Of course, there's doesn't have to be the case always, like there are rearrangements and stuff like this. But uh, usually you should expect that most peaks of your spectrum should have an easy explanation. And if that's the case, then it's always a good sign that your annotation might be correct. Um, yeah, something else might be uh, is this percentage uh, score here. This is basically the matching or the Tanimoto score actually between the prediction and the real fingerprint. And you can think of it like how much of my molecule is predicted correctly. Like in this case, 80% means that the machine learner can predict 80% of this molecule and only 20% of the molecule are unsure. And this is also a really nice uh, value to consider if a hit is correct or not. So if this is maybe 50%, then it's already a little bit fishy. Um, so the last tool basically is then the kinetic class analysis. So what's the kinetic class of the compound? And of course, if we know the molecular structure, we also know the kinetic class. But again, the nice thing here is kinetic class prediction is database free. So it also works if the um, uh, structure is not contained in the database. Um, there's a question, can zeros be used as a reference source for ACMS profiling? Uh, if, I'm not sure what you mean <laughs> with ACMS profiling. Daniel? Maybe uh, we can have the discussion uh, later after you're done with the walkthrough. And then uh, Suleiman can yeah, maybe yeah, rephrase okay. it like accordingly and we can we can have a okay. larger discussion. So, um, yeah, basically the, the last module is Canobus for chemical class prediction. And I mean, here's just a, a view of a typical molecular network uh, from GMPS. Uh, I highlighted all the nodes which can be assigned with live hits which in this case are quite a lot, but you still see a lot of uh, molecular families which don't have a single library hit and you don't know anything about them. And of course you can use CSI finger ID to annotate in CDQ, uh, yeah, structure annotations to them. The problem is you still don't know if they are correct or not correct. And sometimes you might have molecular families where node of the nodes is contained in a structure database and then you cannot assign them properly. And the idea of Canobus is basically to just assign clinical classes to the network, basically color the network based on the clinical classes, like here, where you just color a complete molecular family as bile acids or as uh, phospholipids and so on. And I'll just zoom in there, basically. There's also a nice example, I mean, that's from a, uh, I think, bias gut data set they receive this one big molecular family, but actually it should be two molecular families. Like on the lower here, you have terpene glucosides and the remaining compounds are all uh, flavonoids. And they are still in the same molecular family because these compounds are glucosylated, these compounds are glucosylated. So these compounds are glucosylated, these ones are glucosylated. So they have a high similarity in the spectrum because they share these hexose uh, loss. But um, structurally, they are not so related to each other. And anyways, basically, um, the nice thing is that you now get the complete molecular family annotated with compound classes. And sometimes the compound class of the, of the compounds here do not have to agree with the compound class of the, meta, uh, the spectral library. Like in this example, you have three spectral libraries here, which are all isoflavonoids, but we also had flavonoid glucosides and terpene glucosides in the molecular family. So um, I think with the chemical class design, you get a better uh, resolution basically of the annotations of the uh, of a molecular family. And each node basically has a classifier annotation, which is an ontology of chemical classes, which consists 
on this kind of, um, yeah, it looks a bit like a taxonomy. It's like there's a kingdom, a superclass, a class, subclass, and then level five, six, seven, and so on. And um, also, there are so called additional classes. Um, so a compound, just like a single compound class, but for example, in this case, you have a flavonoid, but it also belongs to the class hexose because it is a glucosylated flavonoid. So it's glucosylated within hexose. So it's basically a flavonoid, but it also belongs to the compound class hexose, which makes the analysis of these compound class sometimes a little tricky because you don't have a single compound class per compound, but a bunch of compound classes. And then you can use these common classes for statistics. So the nice thing is basically because com your complete data set is basically annotated with compound classes, you can yeah, do statistics basically on a large scale. And uh, in our publications, for example, we just, uh, for example, compare the, the four changes between different conditions like your germ-free mouse and specific pathogen-free mouse for different compound classes and find that certain compound class are up-regulated or down-regulated. Um, you can also compare different samples um, with each other, like in this case, we had two different plants uh, species and we compared the distribution of different compound classes. And then, for example, found that uh, uh, diterpenoids are more diverse in the one, compound, uh, in the one species than in the other species. Uh, yeah, so in... This is the last thing here, the Canopus. Just click on it, compute. And no, that's what I mean. No, it's again online again. So we have some instability in the server today. So, come on, class. Still working. Ah, oh, yeah. No. So in this case, it says it's an alpha amino acid derivative, uh, which is not so informative, I think. But um, if you look at these alternative classes, you see there is the class imidulactone. And I think. Um, Here to be, I don't know. Uh, and if you click on this class, you get, uh, you come to the classifier website with a proper description what the class means and also examples uh, how common of these class look like. Um, yeah. And I said this uh, is database free. So even if the correct compound is not contained in the database, uh, this should work. So you know, take another note here, like uh, Then um, basically what we see here is again that the C I think I did hit uh, the best C I think I hit is on a uh, molecular formula which get quite a low zero score. And this is probably just because the correct structure is not contained in the database. So it's more likely that this is the correct molecular formula. And we just don't have the structure in the library. But if you look at the uh, Common class notation, we still see the uh, common classes. In this case, we have oh, yeah, that's the one I searched for. Theo, Hemiam, and all derivatives, however that's pronounced. And if you click on it, uh, here's the description. It's a Theo, Hemiam, group, which has this structure here probably easier to see in this examples. And you see here, this is exactly the structure which is also contained in this 
aus dem Code. Ja, sind ja Partien. So, um, this is exactly the same substructure. Um, so you see basically on the common class level that these molecules are related to each other because they have similar common class uh, associations with each other. Even if the structure basically that is not contained in the database and uh, probably at this level you can then use this the uh, common class and the uh, fingerprints here and try to figure out yourself uh, what could be the correct structure. Um, you can also um, then, for example, if you have drawn on your uh, paper uh, example structure, you can then uh, basically create a custom database here and then just add this data, uh, this structure, a smile string. Um, into this field, and then you can, if you search again, search in this custom database, and uh, yeah, that's would be one way to deal with basically compound that don't contain the structure database. Okay, basically that's that's the modules. We have common classes, structure annotation. So basically, we can go to the questions. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks so much, Kai, for this uh, exciting overview of this super cool tool, I have to say. Also, like the new functions, like it looks really awesome. So I'm very much looking forward to play around with it. And yeah, before we move to the discussion uh, and question section of the seminar, yeah, just thanks again, everybody, uh, for joining us today. Um, next time in two weeks, uh, we're gonna uh, do feature detection with OpenMS and yeah, it's gonna be my pleasure to have uh, Evie and Axel actually doing the guest lectures who are part of the OpenMS development team. So that's, that's really exciting. And yeah, like here again, in case you haven't signed up yet, I like some background informations from our seminar. So yeah, please, uh, if you have not done so, sign up so we can send you the uh, link and information of eventual changes of the seminar. So yes, with this, uh, thanks again for joining and looking forward to the discussion.